welcome to Middle Temple Hall. Welcome back to some of you and a very, very warm welcome back to our guest speaker this evening. We are delighted that she has taken the time and effort to come from some place called Europe to join us for this evening's uh, lecture in honor of the International Women's Day and the first of our treasurer's lectures for this year. For those of you who were young, there must be some young people here. Um, there used to be a thing called the European Union and we belonged to it. No, there still is, but we don't belong to it. Uh, and during our membership, our guest speaker this evening, Master Sharpston, was the first and therefore the only woman advocate general at the Court of Justice of the European Union. And that was a remarkable achievement. Partly I'm told because of her academic skills, but it may also have something to do with her expertise on a motorbike. And I'm sure she can tell you more about that later. She learned at the hands amongst others of Gordon Slynn, who was one of our foremost European and international lawyers. And the lessons she learned from him are manifest in the work that she has done since. We are very, very lucky to have her here this evening. We are delighted to welcome her back. I hope she realizes that this is only the first of a number of invitations that will come her way and she won't have to sing for her supper at all of them. But we are delighted to welcome her, Master Eleanor Sharpston. Master Treasurer, thank you for that enormously kind introduction. And uh, I am indeed immensely happy to be back in Domus. Or if I were to say it in Luxembourgish, I'm really happy to be back home in Domus. Uh, and yes, it, uh, it feels very strange being back with everything having changed, but so many things have changed, that perhaps we should not dwell on that. And perhaps I should try instead to thank you all for turning up by giving you something to listen to before you set about the Middle Temple wine and continue to discuss with each other. And I continue to have the pleasure of meeting again many old friends. So, it all began with an innocent tweet. In the run-up to Holocaust Memorial Day, the New York Times had put up a link to an article, an article whose title was, 80 years ago, the Nazis planned the final solution. It took 90 minutes. The New York Times title. Now, that article described the Wannsee Conference, that infamous meeting of the Nazi party elite in a pleasant little villa outside Berlin, during which the final solution was agreed. Now, I know the historians among you will object, and rightly, that the seeds were sown long before, but that planning meeting was critically important. What was striking was the high level of formal education shared by the attendees. Over half had doctorates, for heaven's sakes. This was a meeting, in theory, of the civilized and the well-educated. Many of them, indeed, shared our intellectual background. And yet, and so on the 21st of January of this year, I put out a little tweet in response and I said, fellow lawyers, be ashamed with me that nine of the 15 officials who met and meticulously planned the final solution had law degrees. What I hadn't bargained upon was the reaction to that tweet. I mean, it seemed obvious to me 
that if you had spent time reading law, you would also have touched upon jurisprudence. You would have been exposed to ideas of law and society and morality. As a law don at King's College, Cambridge, following, I have to say, unworthily in the footsteps of my mentor, that great and fiercely passionate liberal lawyer, Ken Polak, I had always taught law in that way. And the reason was simple. Thanks to Ken, I had indelibly printed upon my intellect and my conscience that law and morality were meant to have some kind of a relationship with each other. And that being a lawyer should not be a profession, nay, a calling that was divorced from having a moral compass. Well, apparently that wasn't a universal approach. Here are some of the replies I received. And the first one was from Joe Moore. exactly the right profession to execute lawful evil plans question mark then there was a gentleman called adam wagner who said yeah maybe but much of german society was complicit in the holocaust and nazi ideology including all professions c.e.g the nuremberg doctors trials so I doubt there is anything particular about lawyers which makes us prone to evil acts. Uh, law played a role for sure. And then Barbara Rich reminded me of the 2001 film Conspiracy about the Wannsee Conference in which, as she described it, in which Colin Firth as Wilhelm Stuckhardt represents, and these are her words, an indelibly chilling loyalness in his participation in the meeting. But then I really did start thinking, and indeed this was the seeds of the title for this evening. Now, I make it very clear, I don't think that lawyers have or, or should have any kind of exclusive claim on virtue, but many, many students read law with a view to playing a role in society. Some are very idealistic and they know they want to come in and change the world for good. Some have an eye to politics. Some are thinking about going into journalism. And those of us who choose to practice the law will inevitably during the exercise of our profession, during our life's work, we will inevitably have an impact on individuals and on society by what we do in our practicing lives. Now, since this is International Women's Day, this is absolutely the moment, and this is a pleasure and honor to do so on International Women's Day, to pay tribute to a very formidable lady, a member of DOMAS, Helena Normanton, KC. She was somebody who was really a trailblazer. She passed her bar finals as a member of this inn on the 26th of October, 1921. So just a hundred years ago. As a matter of fact, uh, for a long time, she couldn't study for the bar because women were not admitted either to this inn or indeed to another inn. She made two attempts to join Middle Temple and those were rebuffed. However, then there was an act of parliament, the Sex Disqualification Removal Act, 1919. And on the 24th of December, 1919, the day after the passage of that act, Middle Temple accepted her application, making her the first woman to be admitted to an inn of court. She was, as it happens, the second woman to be 
actually called to the bar, but certainly the first to practice. And she practiced until her retirement in 1951. And she was a very, very active and morally awake lawyer. She was active in the long-standing campaign to reform the divorce laws, aiming to make divorce more equal and less difficult to achieve and less expensive. She was also actively involved in numerous campaign groups, including the Women's Freedom League and the Married Women's Association. And I'm happy to tell you that the female barristers at Doughty Street Chambers got onto this and nominated her for a blue plaque to be put up at her former residence. And that plaque was put up and was unveiled by Lady Hale exactly on the anniversary of 100 years of her passing her bar exams. So here was a fellow member of Domus who certainly didn't think that law and morality could or should be divorced from each other. So to the rest of the lecture. If you think that one should not just check one's morality at the door, should not just park it in the left luggage to be called for later, when entering Domus as a student desirous of being called to the bar, how do you go about respecting that moral compass during your practice and career? Well, this is probably the moment at which I should, as a good barrister, point to a key distinction between barristers and solicitors. And it's important to bear this key difference in mind. Yes, I know there are lots of key differences. Perhaps we can discuss them over a drink in the reception that follows this lecture. But I have one key difference here in mind. Individual firms of solicitors can and do specialize in particular types of work. Yes, so do many barristers. But as we know, solicitors don't have an equivalent to the bar's cab rank rule. That wonderfully named provision, which says, in essence, that a barrister has to accept any work in a field in which they profess themselves competent to practice at a court at which they normally appear and at their usual rates. Consequence of the cab rank rule, whereas solicitors can, and to some extent do, choose their clients, we barristers cannot. So let's look at morality and the working barrister. I, I had been going to say here, I suppose we should start with the bar code of conduct and the professional statement for barristers. And indeed, the inn kindly sent me the links to the latest online versions of these two documents. So I sat down on a sunny morning looking out onto my garden in Luxembourg, where I live, and I dutifully scanned them both for suitable quotations. An hour later, my draft of this speech had not advanced very far. My head was ringing with references to the 10 core duties. Core duty one, you observe your duty to the court and the administration of justice. And then you get the best interests of the client, acting with honesty and integrity, must maintain your independence, must not behave in a way which is likely to diminish the trust and confidence which the public places in you or in the profession. You must keep the affairs of each client confidential, you must provide a competent standard of work and service to each client, you must not discriminate unlawfully against any person, you must be open and cooperative with your regulators, you must take reasonable steps to manage your practice or carry out your role within your practice competently and in such a way as to achieve compliance with your legal and regulatory obligations. It's ringing prose, isn't it? It's great stuff. A bit bemused, I went on to the professional statement for barristers, incorporating the threshold standard and competencies. Well, it makes some points under part two, personal values and standards, and points were perhaps obvious, but probably deserve emphasizing. So we're told barristers should act with the utmost integrity and independence at all times in the interests of justice, representing clients with courage, perseverance, and fearlessness 
They should be honest in their dealings with others. They should be aware and active in the pursuit of equality and respect for diversity, not tolerating unlawful discrimination in themselves or others. Then there's the practical, of course. They should ensure that their work does not incur unnecessary fees. I'm sure that one is something that the clients will appreciate. I have to say some of the rest of it seems a bit like life coaching. They should, I quote, they should adopt a reflective approach to their work, enabling them to correct errors and admit if they have made mistakes. And they should ensure they practice with adaptability and flexibility by being self-aware and self-directed, recognizing and acting upon the continual need to maintain and develop their knowledge and skills. It's definitely life coaching. Well, it's a curiosity, of course, I then went to see what the other side said. I went and had a look at the rules for solicitors. And uh, it would, there seems to be some disagreement as to how many core principles you need to have. We have 10 core, we have the 10 core rules. Uh, then there are six cardinal principles in the rules for individual solicitors. So you get justice and the rule of law, integrity, independence, best interests of clients, standard of service, public confidence. You see the overlaps there. Uh, and rather confusingly, when you start looking at the standards and regulations, you then get seven principles. So we've got 10, we've got six, we've got seven. Anyway, the coverage is roughly speaking the same. But maybe this is the moment to draw a distinction between day-to-day -day morality in one's practice and what I might call, for want of a better phrase, morality with a capital M. The professional rules, as it seems to me, are closely concerned, but also pretty much exclusively concerned with day-to-day -day morality. So, the core duties, the personal values and standards that I have just been citing to you are all very good and very important in that specific context. You're a good professional. You should also behave like a good human being. You should be upright, honest, hardworking, trustworthy, fair-minded, and so on. And I endorse that without reservation. However, none of that explains to me why my tweet about the Vance conference participants had elicited the responses that it provoked. I mean, I am sure that all the lawyer participants at that conference would have maintained, perhaps even with a little righteous indignation, that they were good, upright, honest, hardworking, trustworthy, and fair-minded professional lawyers. But that wasn't the point, was it? So, what about morality with a capital M? As you rapidly discover at the bar, the cab rank rule means that you are not always on the right side of the case. What does morality mean in that context? I mean, at a technical level, it means doing your job absolutely correctly within the rules and fairly. But at the bigger level, what does it mean? Well, I have to tell you that despite being a passionate Europhile, no surprises there, I found that most of the cases that I did in EU law were for Her Majesty's government. Sorry to say it, but I was therefore usually wearing a black hat. I did lots, for example, lots and lots of home office cases working for the evil empire. I used to joke that in a sense, it wasn't necessary to read my instructions in any great detail because whatever the applicant was seeking, the answer that I was supposed to put forward was of course, no. Can this immigrant have their family join them? Naturally not. Can this particular group of refugees, claimants for refugee status, be given asylum? Of course not, don't be stupid. 
What about a compassionate indefinite leave to, oh, come on, you're joking. It's within the Secretaries of State's discretion to refuse to be compassionate, and that's not reviewable. I have to say, all my work for the evil empire did come in very handy indeed when I did a pro bono case for a Nigerian asylum seeker, because I knew exactly what the evil empire was going to say. And therefore, I also knew some of the better points to put forward to get round what was being said in order to try to get that particular very extreme example of somebody who ought to be given refugee status to get that to succeed. I paused a little footnote. What we had here was a situation where the lady in question had her husband had been killed in one of the uh, coup attempts, was in the military. She had escaped, uh, having been held in detention and having had one of her children killed while she was detained. She came to the UK. She put in an application for asylum. It was refused. She went to the immigration tribunal. The immigration judge said that had there been any separate independent evidence to substantiate her case. He would have said that it was made good and she should be given asylum. But there was no independent evidence. Why not? Because she was a very poor lady and she was very badly represented and the material hadn't been pulled together. I got a phone call at about 10 o'clock on a Sunday evening from a friend of mine from college uh, who was at the same church as this lady worshipped at who said, can you help? She'll be put on the plane tomorrow and she's going to be killed. And all that I did, actually all the credit should go to the instructing solicitor whom I got to instruct me because he is the person who ran around and got all the evidence. So he got in affidavit statements, he got in the dental records showing evidence of ill treatment. He got in statements from, you know, he got in the material that wasn't there. It wasn't a lot of material, but there was some material. And we had the statement from the immigration judge that said, had there been any evidence, independent evidence, then she should be given asylum. And so we went back to the Home Office and said, would you like to look at this again? And of course, the Home Office, like one of those tankers in the channel that cannot change course in less than two miles, naturally the Home Office said no. So then we said, judicial review. And we were lucky in our judge on the application for at that stage, I think it was still called leave permission, I know now. We were lucky in our judge and our judge listened to this and listened to the arguments and the Home Office said we hadn't produced the death certificate of the child. And I a little bit lost my call and said, I don't recall people being required to produce death, death certificates for everyone who died at Auschwitz either. It was, a, it was a slightly warm hearing for permission, as, as, as I recall. Uh, and we were lucky in our judge, and the judge, in the way that judges do, gazed thoughtfully into the top right-hand corner of the courtroom, and he said, Ms. Sharpston, I shall grant uh, leave to proceed for judicial review. It may assist the Home Office in considering this matter further, if I indicate that there are six separate bases on which I would give that permission to proceed. And he listed them. And naturally I was collared quietly by my opponent after the court. If you withdraw the judicial review, uh, we will look at this again. Well, since I couldn't force a decision to grant her asylum out of the judicial review, you know, that's where we did things. And yes, indeed, she got her, she got her asylum status. All the credit goes to my instructing solicitor for doing the donkey work to put material in, because there was somebody who really thought that the morality mattered more than the fees. He knew he could get no money for it. He didn't care. He did his job very, very well. And as far as I was concerned, I, I mean, I used to play Robin Hood. I used to use the fees that I earned from Treasury solicitor cases to cross subsidize my time to do other cases. And I am absolutely not unique in any way at the bar in doing this. Many of my good friends at the bar apply exactly that principle. Now, if, as I was, you were 
both practitioner and academic, you have the further twist that what you submit on instructions in, as a barrister in court and what you teach and write with passion as an academic uh, may be diametrically opposed to each other. And sometimes a mischievous opponent would say to the court with, with that lovely little smile, which you know means they're just about to stick the knife in between your ribs. My Lord, uh, Miss Sharpston's submissions on this point are particularly interesting in the light of her article last year in the European Law Review, where she maintained the exact opposite of what she is now submitting to your Lordship. Now, of course, that, that's not really very fair. I mean, it's actually like shooting a fish in a barrel. Uh, but one is reduced to saying, uh, my, my Lord, I, I was um, there discussing the problem in abstract terms, my Lord. Uh, in the particular circumstances of the present case, my Lord, uh, my submission remains that, or what is probably even worse, uh, my Lord, my instructions on this point are unequivocal. The Home Office's position is that, and you fill in the rest. I know that there is in the audience somebody whom I had the pleasure of teaching a long time ago in Cambridge. Uh, I don't know if she will remember a lecture that I came and gave immediately after losing the case about the working time directive. I was instructed by the UK as junior counsel in case C84 of 94 United Kingdom against counsel which was an application to annul the Working Time Directive. The Working Time Directive, this was a, an application under a Conservative government, and we were directed to try to get the directive annulled because it was very obviously a completely wicked piece of socialist social policy, utterly unconnected with health and safety at work. There was a slight problem about that argument. The problem was, that the very first studies linking excessive working time and accidents at work were studies done during the First World War in this country involving munitions workers. And it was demonstrated, sadly to everyone's satisfaction, that if the munitions workers simply worked ridiculous hours and went on working ridiculous hours, Eventually, they put the wrong little brains together and there was a big bang and they blew up the factory and various people died. These were our own studies showing the link, but nevertheless, we said there was no link. Uh, and I, I mean, of course, as counsel, I was absolutely desolate to see that we'd lost. And I remember going along to give that lecture and I walked into the lecture hall, big lecture hall in Cambridge, with a bit, apparently a big fat smile on my face. And I said, now I need to talk to you today about, uh, I was talking about the different procedures for challenging matters before the court. And I, I have a recent illustration, in fact, is the, the UK's challenge to the working time directive, which, which sadly has not succeeded. And one of my King's students said, you're so happy, aren't you, Leo? I didn't try and deny it. So, at the bar, you have the care bank rule, but you do have the option of giving your time free to causes you believe in. Of course, your clerks may not always be totally happy with that. Uh, I know that when I put in my application for Silk in 1998, about one third of my practice was pro bono. A pattern of cases against the government, which was, of course, utterly typical of a lefty activist lawyer. Uh, and my overall turnover, in consequence, excluding BAT, was just still in five figures rather than six. And it's actually, on that basis, is extremely surprising that I did get silk on that application. So you can, you can give your time free. You can do work pro bono so that if money is collected for a cause, it can go towards helping the actual people whose lives have been affected rather than going to your legal fees. I will tell you that I am immensely proud 
of the fact that the last case I did at the bar before going to the court in Luxembourg was a pro bono case. This is a case known by the name of the ship, the SS Stora. Its actual title is Fog and Lead Guard against the Secretary of State for Defense. This is about a World War II convoy, a merchant vessel, an armed merchantman that was sailing in convoy. It had Royal Navy gunners on board. It had ammunition marked with the broad arrow. The ship was full of tank parts and aircraft parts. It was sailing under Admiralty orders in convoy. And half an hour before she was torpedoed, the Stora had successfully helped to beat off an attack by e-boats. Unfortunately, they came back and they managed to pot her. She went down and 21 sailors lost their lives. Mesdames Fogg and Leggard were the daughters of Petty Officer James Vandell, who was one of those who died on board, and they wanted to get the site of the Stora protected under the Protection of Wrecks Act. Had she been a white ensign vessel, she would have been protected. Had she been the enemy e-boat, she would have been protected. Because she had the red duster at her stern, the Ministry of Defence said, no, the scope of the law is not such as to include this vessel. And after it had taken about five years of research by divers, by archaeologists, by naval historians to piece together the story of this vessel so that we knew what was on board and so on. And it, it was a very symbolic action. I mean, protecting the remains actually required designation on a, on a naval chart, right? It didn't require to have a guard boat rowing around the site. No money was involved, but it required an order designating that site as protected. And because the vessel had sunk in the channel in about 120 feet of water, north of the shipping lanes, she wasn't protected by having tankers steaming back and forth overhead. She was within diving distance. even for an amateur scuba diver like myself. And so we, having tried to get the ministry to designate her, we, we applied for judicial review of the decision that the minister didn't even need to look at it because the law excluded this. We were lucky in our judge at first instance. We were very lucky. We had Mr. Justice Newman. <clears throat> Mr. Justice Newman said, uh, if merchant vessels sank with loss of life in military service, then the vessels and the remains of those who died are capable of being protected by designation. There is nothing in the act which supports the class of vessels which qualify being interpreted narrowly so as not to cause an administrative burden to the state. Because one of the arguments had been, oh, the floodgates will open. It will be all these claims to designate ship. No. The merchant navy turned up in force. The veterans turned up to hear their case. I have never been so proud and so humble simultaneously in my life as I was standing in the high court with, with two rows of very polite elderly gentlemen sitting behind me, all wearing blue blazers, very neat, listening with great attention. They were all Merchant Navy survivors from convoys in World War II. And they wanted passionately to see whether it was possible to have just one symbolic Merchant Navy ship designated as a protected wreck in memory of all their comrades. Mr. Justice Newman recognized that. I quote again, indeed, 
having regard to the aim and object of the act and the importance of its purpose, namely, according respect to the dead and protecting the sanctity of human remains, being considerations at the forefront of the values of a civilized society, such a qualification, such a limitation of reading, unless clearly expressed, can have no place. Now, the Secretary of State for Defense appealed. And I was literally just about to disappear off to Luxembourg to my new job at the court. I am delighted that my co-head of chambers at the time, Michael Pauls QC, who is here this evening, grinning at me, he generously took over the case for round two in the Court of Appeal. He said, you've done the first leg, I'll take it on. Thank you, Michael. Because he took it on in the Court of Appeal, which is going to be much more difficult. I sat and watched very anxiously from Luxembourg. And I'm happy to say that the Court of Appeal, Sir Anthony Clark, Master of the Rolls, and Lord Justices Ricks and Longmore dismissed the appeal. The Master of the Rolls said, we've reached the conclusion that the judge was justified in reaching those conclusions. As we see it, the Secretary of State did not consider the question as broadly as he should have done. The Defence Secretary, in other words, had applied too narrow a construction of the law when refusing the request for the storer to be protected as a war grave. Now, obviously I've been illustrating from my own practice that's what we will do, but what I'm describing is far from unique. I suggest it is one of the true glories of the bar that there are colleagues, many colleagues, who are prepared to give very generously of their time and expertise in what they deem to be a good cause. And I would like here publicly to pay tribute to a group of dear friends and professional colleagues, at least one of whom is present, who acted pro bono for me over a period of over a year before and after I was defenestrated from the Court of Justice of the European Union as an Advocate General. Those dear colleagues range from established silks to nice and very bright juniors. I owe them an immense debt for their kindness and their idealism. Let's move on to morality and the judge, keeping a wary eye on the time. When you're on the bench, what then? Well, you can try and give the law a discreet shove in the right direction. I think the passages that I've been reading you from Mr. Justice Newman and Stora already give an indication of a way of doing that. Lord Denning in his golden period, I don't mean the late judgments, but I mean the really golden period of Lord Denning. We can all think of Denning judgments where Denning was on the side of the little man and he just found a way of reading the law when it was open to two, because the law is usually open to multiple interpretations. So, you know, you're going to choose one or the other. Which way are you going to push it? Another very important point, and this is advice that I was given when I went to the court in Luxembourg, but I think it's extraordinarily good advice, is making sure that the side that's going to lose feels that they've had a decent, fair run. I mean, let's be honest, the side that wins is not going to care. But the side that loses, it really matters that they should feel that they were given space and time and consideration and thought, even if you then rejected their arguments. Making sure that you're scrupulously fair, including to those with whom you do not have natural sympathy. I think that comes very high on my list. It comes high on my list because of an experience that I had that I shall never ever forget. And I think that Master Ronald may remember this particular moment. We were in the House of Lords in Brown and others. We were before Lord Templeman as the chairman of the panel. I was at that stage a very, very, very nervous junior who had never expected to find herself actually pleading because I was your archetypal research wonk. 
I was always the backroom junior who digs out the obscure but useful authority and who works up the arcane but interesting argument. And that was always my function. And to be really accurate, my appearance in Brown was only my 10th time actually on my hind legs since I'd been caught. So you can just imagine my House of Lords, 10th time on my feet. Ah. There I am, and courtesy of the four silks who were involved in Brown, I was actually tasked with explaining the ECHR point to their lordships because it was meant to be my specialist area. So there I was in the House of Lords arguing for the right of sacred masochists under Article 8 of the ECHR, right to privacy, right to family life, to engage in consensual sex. Uh, I think it would be fair to say of Lord Templeman as the chairman of the panel, that he did not have instinctive sympathy either with my position or with my clients. Uh, and at one point, uh, my memory is insistent that he was practically foaming at the mouth, but perhaps my memory exaggerates the dramatic effect. Uh, at one moment, Lord Templeman cut across my submissions to ask the question, and I think for him it was really a rhetorical question. Surely, Miss Sharpston, you, you, you cannot be suggesting that these vile and disgusting activities have anything to do with love. And I remember taking a very, very deep breath, wrapping my gown round me as though it was armor, and then looking him straight in the eyes and replying, yes, my Lord, that is precisely my submission. Now, I mean, that was, of course, very clearly and obviously my duty as counsel. Uh, it did help, but intellectually and emotionally, I, I was also convinced it was the correct submission to be making. Uh, I have to tell you, there was, a, there was a group of polite Sabre massacrists and their friends and supporters at the back of the committee room. Master Warrell remembers this well. There was a slight clanking in the back of the back of the room. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm afraid they did not get a very good impression that their case, that their appeal, was in fact being heard impartially and fairly. And that is very regrettable. Now, obviously, my experience of the bench does not come from this country. It comes exclusively from a particular perspective that of an Advocate General at the Court of Justice of the European Union. And I, I think I want, I just want to make some illustrations very quickly, but I think you have to take as the starting point that the role of the Advocate General and the role of the judges sitting and arriving at a single consensual judgment is not the same. There are things that I could say as an Advocate General that I knew the court would not say in its collective judgment, because it would never get through the drafting committee. But there might be things that nevertheless needed saying. And it seemed to me, I, I, I really don't want to sound either pompous or, or, or pious about this, but it, it did seem to me that because I had that freedom as an advocate general, that I was also under a duty to use it in appropriate cases. I, I want to illustrate that from an opinion that I, I wrote in two cases that arose out of the middle of the 2015 refugee crisis, case C49016AF and case C64616Jafari. And I began by describing the map of Europe. And I pointed out that the system for allocating responsibility for considering asylum applications that's put in place by the Dublin regulation simply ignores that map. Rather, it tacitly assumes that all the applicants for international protection will arrive by air or can be dropped by helicopter somewhere. And if they all arrive by air, there would in theory 
be something closer to an equal chance that very roughly equal numbers of applicants would arrive in each of the 28 member states. But of course, they don't all arrive like that. They came over the land bridge up through the Balkans. And I went on to describe later in the opinion the humanitarian crisis which occurred in the period from September 2015 to March 2016. Now, I will freely tell you that rereading what I wrote then as Russia's illegal invasion of Ukraine sends new floods of refugees across European borders, raises the hair on the back of my neck and sends shivers down my spine. Because this is what I wrote back in 2017 when the case was before the court. This is points 182 and 183 of the opinion. There is a human flood of desperate people. Those fleeing the war in Syria, swelling the numbers of those who have trekked from Iraq or Afghanistan. They sweep up to the Croatian border post in their hundreds, their thousands. They have little or nothing with them. If they're kept out, they will somehow make improvised camps with international assistance as and when it's forthcoming from bodies such as the UNHCR, the Red Cross, and Médecins Sans Frontières to help feed, shelter, and care for them. There will be a humanitarian crisis on the European Union's doorstep. There is an obvious risk that neighboring Balkan states will be destabilized, creating a real danger to peace and security in the region. Winter is coming on. Geography, not choice, dictates which EU member states are in the front line. Those member states, like all the EU member states, have international obligations under the Geneva Convention. For humanitarian reasons, they should clearly admit those suffering fellow human beings into their territory. But if they do so, those member states will not be able to guarantee suitable reception conditions for everyone, nor can they examine everyone's application for international protection swiftly if their administrations are overwhelmed by the sheer number of claims to process. And I went on to draw a conclusion about how you interpret Article 13, Paragraph 1 of the Dublin Regulation. Now, the court didn't follow me in the exact answers that I gave when it answered the referring court. But saying that and putting the spotlight on that in such stark terms, I suggest, I think, I hope, I believe, did help to highlight the problem and focus attention on the need to find a proper solution. It's not only the refugee situation. As I say, that, that just, in present circumstances, that feels terribly close to the bone because you can transpose that to the present situation all too easily. Let's look somewhere else. Let's look at environmental protection. Let's look at the Aarhus Convention and access to justice in environmental matters. NGOs acting. Look at the case, case C-115-09, a case known by the nickname Trianel, because that's easier to spell in Bund für Umwelt und Naturschutz Deutschland, Landesverband Nordrhein-Westfalen. Trianel to its friends. In that case, the German government had spent some time, and they did it very well, explaining to the court what a superlatively rigorous system of judicial review existed under German administrative law. The problem was actually getting in through the door of the court in order to get that superlatively rigorous system applied to the case in hand. And I'm, I have to tell you that I suggested at point 77 of my opinion that like a Ferrari with its doors locked shut, a system of protection is a little practical help if it is totally inaccessible for certain categories of action. 
And I can tell you the court did follow me in that particular case. Uh, I got the opportunity to make a similar point in another Aarhus Convention case, case C6615, uh, protect natur, arten und Landschaftsschutz, Umweltorganisation, etc., etc., protect natur, where, I mean, I said something which is so obvious, but sometimes you need to say the obvious. I said the natural environment belongs to us all, and its protection is our collective responsibility. The court has recognized that the rules of EU environmental law, for the most part, address the public interest, and not merely the protection of the interests of individuals as such. Neither water nor the fish swimming in it can go to court. Trees, likewise, have no legal standing. This is the great advantage of being an advocate general is sometimes if you want to call the spade a spade, you can reach for the word spade and put it in the opinion. It's a lovely feeling. The court didn't speak about fish swimming or trees having standing, but they did get to the right conclusion. I want to conclude with a short illustration. One, it's one more illustration, but I, I really will abbreviate it. And I use it because the concept of solidarity is something which is there in EU law. Solidarity is a strange word to use in an English speaking audience, you, 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 you sort of feel a bit uncomfortable almost with the, what, what solidarity, it's a funny word that. If you say to the French audience, solidarité, so, mais oui, évidemment, il faut être solidaire. We can then discuss what being solidaire means, but the idea that you know, there should be solidarity is essentially is, is there. And um, please remember, you know, the EU project did come out of the devastating and destructive conflict of World War II. The founding fathers of that project, Robert Schumann, Jean Monnet, Conrad Adenauer, they were statesmen from the countries who'd been embroiled in that. And their initial vision had the idea of solidarity, the Schumann Declaration of 9th of May, 1950 famously well recognized that Europe will not be made all at once or according to a single plan. It will be built through concrete achievements which first create a de facto solidarity. And you find an echo of that reference to solidarity in the preamble to the ECSC treaty the precursor to the EEC treaty. You find it in the Treaty on European Union, which mentions in Article 2, common values, a society in which pluralism, non-discrimination, tolerance, justice, solidarity, and equality between men and women prevail. And you find it in the case law of the court, whether you're talking about steel quotas, or disposing of surplus sugar, or looking after a student who's run out of money in the final year of his studies and would like to access the same basic support as his Belgian colleagues. That's the Gazelchik case. And we have the Bidar case on student loans from this country. Solidarity is basically the lifeblood of the European project. And this was a case before the court in which there were actions, infringement proceedings against three member states, Poland, Hungary, and the Czech Republic, who were failing to show solidarity because they were failing to apply the arrangement that had been put in place to try to deal with the refugee crisis and take the pressure off the frontline states. Poland is behaving very well at the moment with the Ukraine crisis. But back with that refugee crisis, Poland was one of the nine Zagas. It was one of the member states that would not accept the arrangement that had been agreed to reallocate applicants for international protection so that the full weight of the problem did not land on Italy and Greece. And trying to deal with that and trying to reach the conclusion that 
you had to you had to apply solidarity. I found myself saying that self-centeredness was a betrayal of the founding father's vision for a peaceful and prosperous continent. It's the antithesis of being a loyal member state and being worthy as an individual of shared European citizenship. If the European project is to prosper and go forward, we must all do better than that. And I permitted myself, ironically, this is an opinion that came out on one of the various dates that Brexit might have happened. It came out on the 31st of October, uh, which was one of you know, in the sequence. And I remember trying to finish it in a desperate, desperate hurry in case, you know, the lights were going to go out over my head at midnight. And I reached for some way of explaining why this mattered so much. And I found myself recalling an old story from the Jewish tradition, which maybe deserves wider circulation. And the story is this. There's a group of men who are traveling together in a boat. And suddenly, one of them takes out an auger and starts to bore a hole in the hull beneath himself. Well, the other men in the boat, his companions, remonstrate with him. Why are you doing that? He says, huh, what are you complaining about? Am I not drilling the hole under my own seat? Yes, they reply, but the water will come in and flood us all. Now, the judgment of the court, I have to tell you, doesn't mention that story from the Jewish tradition. But the judgment from the court went the way it should have gone. And the president of the court, Kuhn Lennart, whatever else he doesn't quote me on, has been quoting that passage on solidarity as being a useful guide to where the European Union should be going. So maybe it is sometimes worth standing up and saying what you believe. Thank you very much. Sharpston, thank you so much for a fascinating lecture. Um, it always takes people in the room a couple of seconds to get their brains working to ask a question. So I'm going to put to you, if you wouldn't mind, a question that's come in um, from one of our audience online, asking whether or not you think that domestic apex courts would benefit from having the equivalent of, or an attorney general equivalent, an advocate general even, sorry, Advocate General equivalent. That's a that's a very good question from from whoever put it. Um, the argument is always made that one of the reasons why the Court of Justice in Luxembourg has AGs is because it doesn't have dissenting judgments, and it's it is an argument, but I don't think it's actually a particularly good argument, not least because you can never tell reading the case law where the court did or didn't or why it didn't agree with the AG or the exact relationship is, is, is very strange. I think that it's not accidental that the tradition of the advocate general or somebody fulfilling that function existed in the supreme administrative courts of, from memory, three of the original six founding states. And when they were designing the new system for the EEC, and they were setting up a court structure, they decided to have Advocates General because Advocates General were useful. They were useful because the AG is not the advocate of any party. The AG is 
somebody of judicial level and status and standing and perspective looking at the problem with a degree of space and liberty that the court actually doesn't have. The court needs to produce a judgment and get to the answer. And I think it's interesting, I've, I've not been a, watching domestic judgments as it were as much as I should, but even I have noticed that over the years, it has become increasingly the case that there is a single judgment in the Court of Appeal, or there is a single judgment in the Supreme Court, or maybe there's a small, you know, but the, the, the days when you had five different speeches in the House of Lords are really days of the past because the pressure on the court is such that frankly, we're not going to do that. And I do think that the Advocate General has a very specific usefulness in terms of being able to gather everything up and say, look, I've been looking at this and here is what it looks like to me. And I'm going to suggest this to you. It's not binding, but please have a think about it. I don't know if there are other questions immediately, I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll as it were, shut up on that point. Otherwise, I'd like to give you an illustration of, as it were, the difference between what, what is the Advocate General doing? Imagine, imagine you have an army marching through unknown territory. And it gets to a place where there are three roads and night is falling. So the General, sets up camp for the night, and he calls in an old trusted colleague of his own level and standing, who was at Staff College, but who, who specialized in military intelligence and scouting. And he says to his colleague, John, please go out, do a reconnaissance for me, and tell me what you think. So John goes out, does the reconnaissance, comes back, I, I hope they you know, give him food and drink when he comes back into the general's tent. And the general Peter says to John, okay, what did you see? Well, I had a look at the left-hand route. It looks fine to start with. And about 400 meters, it goes around the corner and it disappears into a bog. And we will never get the armor and the half tracks through there. Forget the left-hand route. Then there's the centre route. Looks nice. You carry on about a mile and a half down the road. It starts going through a, a sort of narrow place, a bit of a gorge, rock cliffs on either side. Now, I don't say there's anything necessarily wrong with that, but I heard a couple of things that didn't sound, I thought I heard a stone or two roll. And I have a bad feeling about that place. It, it could be fine. You might make it through. If it were an ambush, we would be cut to pieces. That leaves you with the right-hand route. The right-hand route, let's be honest, the first 200 meters, bit of a mess. It's going to be slow. After that, it's actually fine. It widens out, it's flat, it's level. No nasty cover nearby to hide things. My recommendation is we should take the right-hand route. Now, that piece of reconnaissance and that evaluation is extremely valuable. Of course, John is not the general of the army. Peter is the general of the army, in my illustration. Peter is absolutely at liberty. I don't think he's going to take the left hand path. But Peter is at liberty to take the middle path and take the risk, or take the right hand path. That's his choice. But it is a very useful exercise to have had somebody looking at that, looking at it with the, with the eye for the terrain, and looking at it from the perspective of taking the army through. This is not a just a sort of 
forgive me, an academic exercise. This is the real life exercise. Where should the army go? And I think if you use that a bit as the illustration for what a good advocate general should do, I think that the question, does it help to have an advocate general, in a sense, begins to answer itself in the affirmative. Sorry, Fergus. There is a microphone. Krista has it there. No, you probably don't need a microphone. No, I probably don't need a microphone. <laughs> It was um, the first time Fergus that you did. Well, yeah, exactly. Oh, gosh, I'm obviously not very used to using one. Um, Master Sharpston, taking your illustration of an army, there are two armies in Luxembourg. There's the main court and the general court. Now, the general court could have an advocate general, but they don't use it. So are you saying that um, maybe the general court gets lost or... Does it need an advocate general, or is it always perfectly en route? You're, of course, entirely right that the general court has the power to have advocates general. And if my memory serves me, they did right at the beginning, they made use of that power in, I think, four cases. Uh, I believe uh, David Edward, when he was a judge at the general court, for example, acted as advocate general in a particular case. I think there is a less good reason for the general court to have advocates general than for the court of justice to have advocates general, in the sense that, of course, there is, you know, it's a first instance jurisdiction. It is a general court and there is an appellate jurisdiction. Now, I mean, you could also say that the general court has tried to guide, guard itself against uh, being accused of missing things by writing judgments which are of extraordinarily, extraordinary length and complexity. And so, you know, perhaps it deals with not having an advocate general by crawling over the terrain itself in excruciating detail before it actually decides which path it's going to take. Uh, I don't mean that to sound, to sound rude, uh, and I hope it doesn't sound rude. Uh, I think that, uh, I think it also is partly a feature of how people plead. I have been deeply struck when I was dealing with uh, appeals in trademark cases to find myself dealing with pleadings which had six grounds of appeal, except that each one was subdivided into four parts, which left you with 24 bits. And, you know, did you then, I mean, my instinct was to be completely brutal and say, there are three points in this case, you know, and if we take what's actually been pleaded and we group all of that together, that's the first point, and then that's the second point, and then that's the third point. Now, that's a very common law approach. It's a brutally common, common law approach. A civilian lawyer would be indeed, well, they were horrified that I tended to do things like that and say, Mais vous, vous n'avez pas traité uh, le, le, le quatrième moyen uh, dans sa troisième branche. And I'd say, yes, I have. The fourth ground of appeal, third branch, is covered in what I said in part two. And there'd be a long pause while everyone was just, well, maybe. Yes, it is. So, I mean, there's also, there's also a cultural issue here. I mean, I think that, that's part of the answer. So, the master minors and then, uh, well, whichever way, the lady in the second row. Thank you. Um, thank you for the talk. Um, I, it's part of the problem with morality uh, um, and the law because we confuse justice and law. Uh, we talk a lot about justice and the, the Administration of Justice Act and the Department of Justice. I work for the Ministry of Justice. Um, I used to be a barrister. 
Um, but when I was, a, I mean, a proper barrister, um, when I was a, a barrister, though, uh, one was limited by the law. And of course, if you are a judge, you, you swear an oath to do right to all manners of people after the laws, not just whatever seems right, full stop. Um, and we confuse the, the two concepts, which have become completely blurred in popular thinking. It, the job of Parliament is, of course, to pursue justice. The job of the lawyer is to do the best he or she possibly can um, and, and come up with perhaps an answer, which may be very unjust, um, but because the, the other side there to put it right, of course. So the, who the, may the best person win? But, but I just wonder whether we have completely lost that injustice is, is an abstract concept. Any parent knows when you're negotiating with two small obstreperous uh, children, they have a very clear indication of justice. They couldn't care less about law, um, but they know about justice. And maybe we will only get full justice when we get to the pearly gates. Um, but in the meanwhile, this side of the pearly gates, we, we unfortunately are constrained by the law and, and we just, therefore, the, the, the Parliament on the one hand, the Law Commission and other such organisations on the other, are there to try and ensure that the law, as far as is reasonably possible, what a cop out, um, it, it complies with justice. But, but we are stuck with having to do law. I'm sure that you're entirely right that there is a confusion between law and justice. And I, I was very pleased to hear you say that Parliament pursues justice, and I confess I wasn't entirely sure that I'd always noticed that. Um, but I, I, I also can think, and I'm going to take the example of the Thedomasochist case, I can think of excellent work done by the Law Commission, uh, because during the time that that case took to run, uh, through the courts and then through Strasbourg, through the commission and then the court in Strasbourg. There were two reports of the Law Commission on the Offences Against the Person Act and the Law of Consent. It was a small initial report and then a much fatter follow-up report, which was deeply thoughtful, careful, detailed, rigorous, intellectually robust, moral, and which came up with the recommendation that we really should do something about the situation because this was a complete dog's dinner of where the common law got to with statutes and then interpretation. And that there should be, the law should be moved so that it should be possible, I summarise from memory, it should be possible to consent to actual bodily harm but not to grievous bodily harm. And it would have been a very nice and clear distinction, and it would have done very good things to that particular area of the criminal law. There were no votes in it. And that law report, to my knowledge, has never been actioned. As for, as for again, I agree, <laughs> I'm sure I agree with you that the only, only at the further gates will we actually probably get to the ideal justice. I think I'd like to make two points in answer to your comments, which are, which are very thoughtful ones, and I hope that my responses help to contribute to thinking about it. It's not a response in the sense of an answer, and this is the answer. The first part of the answer is that law usually leaves some room for interpretation. Whether you draft your law as tightly as does do parliamentary council, or whether you have the continental style of drafting, which is much more the broad statements of broad principle, there is usually scope for discussion as to how a particular term or particular phrase should be nuanced. Do I go wide, do I go narrow? And there you do have a choice if you are the judge ruling on interpretation which way you go, providing the text will support either. And I would suggest that that choice can properly be informed by a consideration of what would be the just result. My other point, and I think I'm here very much uh, betraying my decades as a 
continental EU lawyer rather than the common lawyer, is I look at the German example. I look at what happened in Germany in the 30s. I look at all the laws that were enforced and I look at what happened. And then I look at the fact that in the aftermath of the Second War, Germany decided it had to have a Grundgesetz and it had to have some very, very basic principles which are there above all the other laws that are put in place by parliaments. Because certain values, certain moral values had to be enshrined, had to be protected. And, you know, every time that there has been, from time to time, there are sort of turf wars between the Luxembourg court and the Bundesverfassungsgericht in Karlsruhe. Yeah? And every time my colleagues in Luxembourg say, you know, they're being a damn nuisance, oh, what are they on about again? And I think I'm so pleased that Germany has got national constitutional court judges who are patrolling their territory because that is the best safeguard for justice. But that is what happens. And so I don't, you know, I have a liking, if you like, because of my background, I have a liking for having that kind of super law, which is a set of values which is more difficult to sweep aside. Because I am very conscious of the fact that laws can be put through parliaments, which I will use the word, which pander to particular present tendencies. I'm sure that, you know, if we were to do it on the basis of what would the people like, uh, as far as I know, there's never yet been an instance in this country where the popular sentiment would not bring back hanging. But nevertheless, we have decided as a civilized society that we do not think the death penalty is a good idea. Genevieve, very quick question. Standing between people in a glass of wine. Oh my goodness. Well, thank you so much for such a stimulating lecture. Um, to take it back to um, how to be a moral lawyer, your examples were often from the self-employed bar and the judiciary. My takeaway was as a junior self-employed practitioner, you can play Robin Hood within the constraints of the cab rank rule and be a moral practitioner within the constraints of the law that's probably the limitation as a member of the judiciary you can nudge the law and patrol the territory for i i was at the self-employed criminal bar i'm now in house counsel at the bank of england and i have a similar role to people in the government legal service who, who work with policymakers. and i suppose it's a similar context to the german example you gave at the beginning and that's my question really Taking it back to that, do you think that we have enough built in protections, perhaps through the human rights framework and the public sector equality duty to mitigate those sorts of immoral laws coming into place in the UK now? Are we in a good place? That's a terribly difficult question. Because for so many years, the UK operated on the basis of a lot of unwritten law and unwritten conventions, which I, I speak with diffidence with a professor of constitutional law sitting in the front row, but my recollection of everything I was taught when I was learning constitutional law is, uh, you know, uh, there's the law, but then actually there's an awful lot else that's there which in fact operates in order to make sure that the system works. And when you take that and you take the Human Rights Act and you take and you take, then the system should work. My concern is that a lot of the unwritten law and a lot of the conventions that nobody dreamt of overriding 
somehow don't seem quite as solid as they used to. I'm trying not to put that in too negative a way, but I was, uh, I was disturbed. I was disturbed to the attempt to prorogue Parliament, for example, Gina Miller said, case number two. I really was disturbed to hear one of Her Majesty's ministers standing up in Parliament and saying that the draft of the Internal Market Bill did break international law but only in a specific and limited way. And I thought to myself, and the next time uh, I or a young friend of mine has got a case where they're trying to get off a burglar who came in and stole something, I just don't fancy my chances if I say to the magistrate, well, you know, sir, uh, it, it is true he came in and he, he nicked the telly, but I, I would like to point out it was a very specific and limited burglary, and he 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 didn't uh, he didn't search the house for jewellery, he didn't take the spare cash he saw lying by the telephone, and he didn't eat the children's dinner which was on the table. So it's it's actually all right because it was really only specific and limited. I don't think that works, and it's it's little things like that. I was deeply impressed by Sir Jonathan Jones' resignation. That was an upright and moral act by somebody of great integrity. And he said, yeah, I, I cannot continue as Treasury Solicitor, for instance, if it's like this. And I have a lot of respect for that. But I think the difficulties are, if you run a system which, is, which has soft boundaries of convention, then everyone has to accept the conventions. If that general acceptance, for whatever reason, is no longer there, I'm sorry, the Continental in me says, I'd like some hard barriers, please. Not said. There are, in all cases, things which shouldn't make a difference, but do. And in the sadomasochism case, there was still a shorthand writer in the House of Lords, very Dickensian, bent over a desk. And when judgment was given, he came up to me and he patted me on the shoulder and he said, never mind, Miss Worrell. It was the over 70s that were against you. Can't follow that. Ladies and gentlemen, pulling together some of the comments very, very briefly, I just would like to echo what was said by Master Sharpston about solidarity and indeed to repeat a phrase used by Master Miners about the pearly gates. And I just remind you all what Madeleine Albright said, there is a special place in hell for women who don't help other women. Ladies and gentlemen, join with me please in thanking Master Sharpston for a wonderful lecture.